Welcome to, uh, welcomes, greetings from Arizona. How's that? Where are we now live? Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, well, again, greetings from Arizona, where at this time in the day, it's already 103 degrees. Last Sunday, we did have church, even though it was 120 and uh, it was a hot, that's hot for Arizonans as well. Uh, we stay inside. It's very dangerous. It's kind of like when it's below freezing here. You know, you don't stand out in the weather. You just go through it to where you got to be. Uh, same kind of thing. Uh, it's just on the other side of the thermometer. We're here to talk about spiritual life, one of probably my favorite theological subjects. I don't pretend to want to say anything new to you this week, this weekend, but perhaps in saying some things we're familiar with, we can connect some dots in ways you never thought they were connected. So I, I trust that this will be a time of blessing, a time of uh, important growth for all of us. It has been for me as I've prepared, uh, and I hope that it will be for you as you listen to things familiar, but perhaps in a different context and in ways that will make it uh, brand new. Let's pray. Father, we count it a great privilege to be able to represent you here on earth, to be in your image as your representatives. We count it a privilege to be hid in Christ by your grace. So we are made part of eternal life, and eternal life is made part of us. Father, we count it a privilege to know that in Christ we are complete, that you have done everything that pertains to life and godliness, and you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Father, we count it a privilege and we thank you that in Christ we have our life, that it's his life living in us, it's his life living through us, and miraculously enough, it's his life living as us in the context of this fallen world and in the context of your people, fulfilling his law by the power of the Spirit. Father, as we talk about these things this weekend, may your Spirit make us careful listeners to what the Spirit has already said in Scripture so that we might leave here knowing you better, more, being more available to you, and in some way being more like your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised with a spiritual mindset. But one thing I've discovered about humanity is every human being is a spiritual person. Every human being, regardless of where they've been born or where they live, has been created in God's image, according to God's likeness, and their inner man is being formed and transformed and changed day by day, in the context in which God has, in his sovereignty, has set them. 
And in my upbringing in the state of Florida, I grew up in a very peaceful home, a normal home, if you would. Mom stayed at home. Dad went to work. Uh, I had an older brother who beat me up. That was normal. I had a younger sister who avoided both of us. That was normal. And I didn't hear about Jesus Christ. I didn't hear about spiritual things. I was a spiritual person, nonetheless, separated from God, so therefore dead in trespasses and sin, but completely unaware that there was a man who took my place on a cross who rose from the dead. It wasn't until I was 18 that somebody shared that message with me. And upon first hearing about Christ on the cross, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. From that point on, everything became different. I didn't know it would be different. Nobody told me it would be different. I was introduced by new birth into a life that included a personal relationship with God. Not an institutional relationship with God through a church or an organization, but a personal relationship with God where God himself resided within me, became part of me, and I became part of him. We were one together by the unity of the Spirit. Christ in me, me in Christ, the Father in me, the Spirit in me. And I was placed in both of them, all three of them. As Jesus prayed, Father, that they may be one even as you are one, and they, we may be one in them and they might be one in us. A whole new world, a whole new relationship. And by God's grace, I was surrounded by people who thought the same thing. I was never given an opportunity to just become nominal. Uh, the people that surrounded me were people in the early 70s who, who had a passion for Jesus Christ and who understood that a relationship with Jesus Christ was something very personal, that God was spirit, and those who worshipped him must worship him in spirit and in truth, that every man was and every woman was created with a spiritual likeness to God and a spiritual kinship to God in a creatorial way, and that we were all spiritual beings, and that we were created by God in order to have a personal relationship with God. The people that surrounded me all thought like that. And so I began to hear Bible studies, and I began to hear, uh, watch films, and I began to go to meetings where everybody talked about knowing Jesus personally. So I never had this gap of time thinking that being a Christian meant going to church. Christianity was always a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you would, Christianity was always Jesus Christ himself. Now, I didn't know a lot of verses to stick together, and I didn't know a lot of neat terms to describe what was going on, but I knew that within the first few months of my Christian experience, within the first few months after being born again, that there wasn't anything about my life that resembled the life previous. I didn't know what trajectory was on. If you would have told me then that I was supposed to speak to a group of people like you or others like you around the world, I would have said, you're crazy, I'm out of here. I think I will go back to the rock festival from which I came. God had you know, a plan to take me along progressively, gently, always treating me with kid gloves because he knew how fragile I was and how stupid I can be at times. And he just kept me nurturing me along, putting me in, in safe places where the people around me were stronger and more willing and more uh, dedicated than I so that I, they would rub off on me. You know how that is. You get around people who encourage you in to love and good works and who one another you with love and with the right correction in the right direction at the right time. And God nurtured me and he began to teach me about himself and he began to tell me that, you know, you can know me personally and I can talk to you and we can walk together and we can have prayer together and we can think the same thoughts and you can think my thoughts and I'll have to listen to your thoughts and we can have this kind of a relationship. 
And I began to see this in other people. I remember my Bible college president. On Fridays, he would have family chapel, and he would always share his war stories and how he walked with Jesus. And I began to listen to that and think, I want to walk with Jesus. I don't know what that means, and I don't know how to do it, but I want to walk with Jesus. I guess I'm heading to be a pastor or something. I don't know what that means, but I don't care about all that. I want to walk with Jesus. I want him to say, I like you. I know he loves me. I've got the cross to prove that. But I always wanted Jesus in the privacy of my quietness to say, and I like you too. You know how that is. We love everybody, but we don't like everybody. Right? Yeah, all right. I knew Jesus loved me. I wanted him to like me. And so that's what we're here to talk about this, this morning and today and tomorrow. Is what, what is this spiritual life? What is Christian spirituality? What is knowing God and his son? And what is experiencing personal fellowship with God? What does that look like? How do I, how do I achieve that if I have to achieve anything at all? Uh, let's, we're going to talk about that. We're going to have times of, uh, where I talk and we're going to have questions and answers and we're, we're not going to be able to discuss everything that, that I'd like to tell you. We don't have time. We're going to talk and bring up some subjects that I think are very important to understand in order to get a grasp on what Christian spirituality is. We know from the Bible that when we define the Christian life, that according to Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you and the one you have sent. So eternal life is knowing God. We know from Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that the Apostle Paul said, I count everything as lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, that I might know Him in the power of His resurrection and in the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to the likeness of His death. We know that eternal life, we know that the Christian life is knowing God. I delight in passages when Jesus says in John 14, that if you keep my commandments, my Father and I will disclose ourselves to you and we will make our home with you. That's reflected in the Old Testament as well in Psalm 25. It says that the secret of the Lord is with those that fear Him. And there's this idea of knowing God in a way like I know people down the street or I know my wife and my kids. Knowing God like that in such a personal way has always been the passion of my heart and it's what we've been called to do. Knowing God and His Son is the Christian life. Experiencing per personal fellowship with God. I love how 1 John chapter 1 starts out. I, I love what John is saying when he begins his little letter to the people at Ephesus. He says, The life was manifested and we have seen that and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. And we have seen and heard and we proclaim to you also that we may have fellowship, that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you so that your joy may be full. I trust that's your motivation this morning, to know God, to know Christ to experience the eternal life that you already possess if you're born again. Because this is the Christian life. A lifestyle in relationship with God through His Son by the Spirit which experiences the conscious development of our character and devotion to please and glorify God. That's the Christian life. To walk with Jesus. If we define the Christian life it's not about denominational affiliation. It's not about church attendance. It's not about seminary degrees. It's not about Bible studies. It's not about any of the religious trappings we find ourselves 
accustomed to with institutionalized Christianity. It's Jesus Christ and a relationship with the Father, God the Father, our Creator, through Christ by the Spirit. If that interests you, stick around. If you're wondering how to build a bigger church, if you're wondering how to preach a better sermon, I'm the last guy you want to talk to. I've done neither. And I don't intend to share with you any secrets about how to not do it this morning. Now, to begin with, I'd like to start our journey the way Paul started the book of Romans. He got everybody lost before he told everybody how to get saved. You ever notice that? Book of Romans starts out by getting everybody lost. Because you can't begin to appreciate the grace of God for salvation. You can't begin to appreciate the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts that we might live righteously and soberly in this present evil age. You can't begin to appreciate the depth of God's mercy and grace until you begin to appreciate the depth and the depravity, what sin and death have done to the human race. And so we're going to start on the negative side of the ledger. We're going to talk about the the things that have destroyed our lives and have made Christian spirituality an impossible task apart from the work of God and His grace. And we need to understand the difficulties we face in, in living the Christian life. We've defined the Christian life as a lifestyle in relationship with God through His Son by the Spirit. We need to understand some of the difficulties, and I don't have anything new here. I have three very simple categories. You've heard them before. The world, the flesh, and the devil. I call it Satan or evil supernaturalism, society, our culture, and sin. We're going to talk about those very briefly this morning in our first session and just see where that takes us and why these present such an awesome obstacle to our being spiritual apart from the grace of God. The first thing I'd like to mention is, let's start at the top, or I should say start at the bottom. Let's talk about evil supernaturalism. That's my fancy word of saying Satan and his demons. The sons of God, as as they are called in the Old Testament, aren't they? Psalm 82 says that, God calls the gods into a council. These are the sons of God. The same sons of God we find in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. The same sons of God that we find in Genesis chapter 6. These are created beings by God. They're angelic beings. And God has given them dominion over the nations of the earth. And in Psalm 82, he gathers the gods, the Elohim, together, and he rebukes them for their atrocious handling of the human race. Rather than being kindly, rather than being shepherds, rather than being stewards of God's creation, they've begun to destroy it and exploit humanity and use humanity for their own selfish gain. And of course, we understand Satan is among these, according to Job chapter 1. And we understand that from Scripture, that Satan is a murderer and a liar. John chapter 8, verse 44, he's a murderer and a liar. From the beginning, there is no truth in him. We learn from Scripture that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John chapter 5, 19. We learn from Scripture that he's called the God of this age, and God in his providence has seen fit to give Satan and these sons of God dominion over the earth and dominion over the human race in such a way as to perpetrate evil and crimes against humanity that God's grace would shine from the depths of these angels' depravity. And so we discover that angelic strategies, strategies of illness, strategies of fear, strategies of bondage, strategies of false religions, we discover that through evil supernaturalism, the entire world is bound in darkness. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden from those whom the God of this age has blinded their minds. And he blinds our minds through the superior God's small g of intellect, 
through the gods of false religion, through the gods of fear, through the gods of loose living, through the gods of immorality, through the gods of our own appetites. As Paul said to the Philippians, that these men who have strayed from Christ have made their own appetites their gods. Evil supernaturalism is at the forefront of this strategy to keep humanity blinded. You and I are all a product of their strategies. We live in a culture, a society, that has a philosophical and religious worldview that's contrary to Christ. We live in a society that has values of pursuits and achievements that are contrary to Christ. We live in a society that has taught us character and behavioral patterns that are also contrary to Christ. Not only is satanic strategy oppressive in and of itself, but the society that this strategy has produced has given us values and habits and practices and ideas that are contrary to the Word of God, contrary to the laws of Christ, and contrary to the ways of Jesus. And you and I have grown up in that way. Every one of us, we can't escape it. Our love and our appetites for things of this planet and things of this world, though not evil in and of themselves, all take us in ways that cause us to doubt, give us skepticism, produce those same fears that are found in people who do not know Jesus Christ at all. Every one of us. I counsel me, I counsel people just like you who are scared to death and yet they know Jesus Christ who have gone the wrong way because of values taught to them by their culture, values of pursuits and achievements by which we judge our worth, your income, your looks, right? Your education, your job, your status in society, whether you have it or you failed In achieving those things, we judge ourselves to be worthy and worthwhile. Our behavior patterns, whether they fit our culture, whether they don't fit our culture, all part of an evil supernatural strategy to ward us away from the sure and simple mercies of Jesus Christ. These are obstacles we face with Christian spirituality. To have a relationship with God in truth through His Son by the Spirit has to face head-on the obstacle, the lies, the murderous lies of evil supernaturalism that are embedded in a culture to which we find ourselves near and dear, and which has shaped us since the day we could say mama and daddy, which our school teachers and our professors have ingrained in us, which our sports figures and our celebrity heroes have reinforced in us, which our parents and our friends have nurtured through us. We are all products of this strategy. And if you say, ah, not me, you're already a product of that strategy. (laughs) And not me, I've overcome that. Well, you have, but not all of its patterns. And if all that weren't enough, there's one more S. Satan, society, and of course, sin. Now sin, wow, that's nasty. That's like a computer virus. You know, we are the hardware that God created. And it wasn't long after the hardware was made and the machine was running that Adam made a choice in the garden to be self-sufficient. He chose his own reasoning rather than God's and it injected humanity with a virus. You know what a virus does to a computer. No matter what key you push, the computer does whatever it wants or whatever the virus tells it to do. And the things that you want to do, you can't do. And the things you don't want to do is happening on the screen all the time. Oh, it sounds like Romans 7. Oh, wait, it is Romans 7. It's a virus, and it's so powerful, we can't fix it. Our human flesh, and the word flesh isn't evil in and of itself. The word flesh just means human. 
Our human flesh is so weak in and of itself that this virus continually just reforms itself and reforms itself and reforms itself and reforms itself and we push every key and every button we shut it down we reboot it we do everything we know to do to get our computer to work and when we put the screen when we put it back on and the screen comes up it says sorry <laughs> you can't do this and a page 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 and a screen goes black and it goes you know you've if you've ever had a virus, they're nasty. Well, every one of us has a virus. It's called sin. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, I am fleshly, I am made of flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. And he was talking present tense as a believer. I believe that Romans 7 is Paul's experience as a believer apart from the grace and power of Jesus Christ living through him. He wanted to recount for his readers, what it's like to live the Christian life apart from Christ. The things that I want to do, I can't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Every Christian admits to sin, 1 John chapter 1. We acknowledge that sin's presence and power resides in every human being, Jesus excluded. Additionally, sin's presence has a tremendous debilitating effect on everyone, according to Romans chapter 7. Sin's first and foremost important effect on us was death. When Adam sinned, he died. He was separated from God. His spiritual life, which was to be paramount in directing him in his stewardship of the garden, was separated from God and his soulish life took over. He became a mere being, a mere animal life human being directed by his own appetites rather than a spiritual awareness of God. He died. Paul said it this way, you are dead in your trespasses. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Spiritually dead. While we remained a spiritual being, we were completely alienated from a life with God. And sin's effect takes place in us in such a way that it directs our inner appetites away from spiritual and toward the physical and earthly. Sin directs our intellect away from a trust in God's testimony and toward a reliance upon our own reasoning and our own ingenuity. Sin redirects our will, our choice mechanism, towards a self-centered and self-reliant choices that are independent from God. Sin impacts our emotions in conjunction with our self-centered appetites, a mindset and daily selfish choice orientation so that our emotions become distorted. And it's all about me, and it's nothing about you, and it's certainly nothing about you. God. And when we do think thoughts about God, we think thoughts about God in such selfish ways that we think He no longer loves us and we've distorted the very grace of God that has come and been given to us to offer salvation. That's what sin does. Sin, impact over our faculties of each human, directs our moral compasses so that mankind does wickedness. Even our righteousness is wickedness apart from Christ. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We don't get it, but sin understands this virus that controls us has corrupted every aspect of this hard drive and every aspect of this hardware that God created to have a relationship with him. Every aspect. Sin's impact over our faculties estranges us from ourselves. How many people have I counseled who hate themselves? And in our self-hatred and our self-deprecation, we hate others. We treat others the way we treat ourselves in a distorted and loveless manner. And then we hoist that kind of sensation upon God's motives as though he's some large being out there manipulating us for his self-aggrandizement. Wow, sin does that? It estranges us from me. Sin estranges us from ourselves and others. It tears apart fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and husbands and wives and workers and co-workers and churches. Why? Because the virus just keeps popping up on the screen. Me, you, hate, loveless. 
Sin distorts. Sin's impact regarding life with God is that of spiritually stillborn. Wow. Sin does all that. By the way, I have verses for all these. Uh, Romans 3.11, Philippians 3.19, Romans 1.21, Romans 8.6 and 7, Romans 3.11 through 12, John 3.19, John 3.20, Romans 1, 26, 1, 28, 7, 14, 7, 23, Ephesians 2, 12, Ephesians 2, 1. Sin remains a pervasive force within every human being, Christians included. A pervasive force within every human being, our weak human flesh, overwhelming our own abilities to do what is right and sin through our own unique makeup and over the course of our life as Satan's strategies and society's education takes place. Sin over the course of our lives develops a dispositional, perceptional, and behavioral pattern that has become part of our unique personalities. And our uniqueness in personalities develops these patterns of behavior that under the right stimulation behaves a certain way contrary to the ways of Jesus Christ. We call these flesh patterns. Get the sense that Christian spirituality is impossible in the energy of our own flesh, in the energy of our own humanness, in the ingenuity of our own self-constructs, that the institution called the church, that all the Bible study in the world, all of the perseverance that we can muster to do the right thing, that we could ever muster to do the right thing, is insufficient to bring about the transformational difference that God wants to make in our lives. Do you get this idea? Sin is just too powerful. It's too pervasive. In theology, we call this total, what? Depravity. Wow. And so we develop patterns. Patterns based on our embedded spiritual and philosophical worldviews. Patterns embedded in our values of pursuits and achievements. Values embedded and reinforced through certain character and cultural behavioral patterns. We've produced flesh strategies for living over the course of our lives. Yes, even we as Christians produce flesh strategies, that is, ways in which in our human weakness so saturated with sin's overpowering influences, we develop and ingrain in ourselves and through our personality, ways that we can develop skills, cope with life, solve our problems, meet our needs, and become, at least in our own thinking, a success apart from Christ, even if it's for Christ. And so, living independently, even for Jesus, we become self-absorbed. We develop habits of withdrawing, remaining aloof, becoming obsessed with accomplishments, escaping pain pressure through carousing, overeating drugs, alcohol, religious activity and service, television, work, athletics, sex, hobbies, games, talking, computers, sleep, pornography, religion, entertainment, reading, we become self-disciplined by being a perfectionist, overcompensation, legalism, being too hard and too strict, setting unrealistic standards, haste, basing acceptance upon performance. We become self-indulgent by being impulsive, buying, craving, addictions. We become anxious, by living in fear, lacking peace and rest, emotionally paralyzed, paranoia. Do you get what sin has done to the human race? Is anyone here not a victim of some of these things that I've read? I am. Became aware, the more I grew in Christ, the more I became aware that 
while God has saved me and he has set me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and he's equipped me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, he did not see fit to just simply remove these flesh patterns from my life and he did not see it fit to simply take sin away from me because he had a certain purpose for all of this. A grand purpose for all of this. And while I've painted a very bleak picture of humanity, even Christian humanity. There's one more point I'd like to make this morning. When does this session end, by the way? Four o'clock? <laughs> 10 15. Okay, it'll I got time. I got time for one more point, a poem and a prayer. All right. That's how you preach, right? Three points, a poem and a prayer? That's what we were taught in seminary. Is that, is that, you got that? Mike, you got that? Three points, a poem. You can use a hymn if you want. And then a prayer. Okay. Third point. You got that, Joe? I see you writing it down. I know you teach men at your church. Three points, a poem, and a prayer, dude. We've defined the Christian life. It's a lifestyle in relationship with God through his Son by the Spirit, which experiences the conscious development of our character and devotion to please and glorify God. We've reviewed, just a review, some of the highlights of what makes this life impossible on our own. Evil supernaturalism, the strategies of Satan, the sons of God over the nations of the earth, right? Right? through fear of death, through sickness, false religions, and false philosophies. And we've also seen how society has embraced these strategies and these ideologies. And every, every society has its own set of values for philosophy, religion, its own set of values for what is good and bad and what makes a person valuable or worthless in their own culture. Every culture may embrace different things, but they all embrace those broad areas. We were raised in one of those. And finally, we discovered that the Bible teaches us about this virus called sin, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all except for Christ, in case you're trying to be nitpicking this morning. Uh, trust me, I teach at a seminary. I know nitpicking. <laughs> but there's less something I've left out. And as Bible believers, we often lead this, leave this out. Because there's something in the back of our mind, and it's part of the lie. It's part of the lie. There's something in the back of our mind that says, we're living in plan B. That all of this, what I described, is true, but it isn't what God wanted. And I'm here to tell you it is what God wanted. Or I'm not a Bible believer. How many of you believe that God is sovereign? Raise your hand. Oh, good, I'm talking to Bible believers. How many of you believe Psalm 115, verse 3, when it says, God sits in heaven and does whatsoever he pleases? Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you believe Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, when it says, God works all things according to the counsel of his will, to the praise of his glory? All right. How many of you believe Psalm 33, verse 11, when it says, God's counsel shall not fail, but shall accomplish what it pleases? I shouldn't have raised your hand because I made up that last half. <laughs> I combined two verses. But, but the Bible teaches that. Psalm 33, verse 11. You can write that one down. That's a good one. How many of you believe in Isaiah 46, Verses 9 and 10 where he says, I am God, there is no one like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and my purpose shall stand. How many believe that? 
I, I believe those. You know what that tells me? We're not in plan B. That before the, count, before the foundation of the world, in God's timeless fellowship with himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in God's comprehensive knowledge of all things, did you believe he knows all things? Past, present, future, things possible, things not possible. I mean, he even knows contradictions and silliness. Of course he knows silliness. He created me. <laughs> if you knew me, you'd understand what I just said. He knows things that are actual. He knows things that are not actual. The Bible even says so. You remember when Jesus was rebuking the cities along the Sea of Galilee? He said, if I had done these miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that verse? It's in Matthew. If I had done these miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and they would still be here today. Was he guessing or did he know that? Sounds like he knew it. You get another instance of this in 1 Samuel chapter 22. David is going into this city called Calah. And Saul understands David's in this city. And David puts on the priestly ephod and he says to God, God, if I stay in this city, will the people of this city hand me over to Saul and will I be killed? And God says, if you stay here, you will surely be handed over to Saul and you will surely be killed. Was that a guess or did God know that? You know what? It never happened. David left. God knew a future that would never happen. We believe that in God's omniscience, he knows every possibility. I believe that with all my heart. I believe the Bible teaches that. I believe he knows my thoughts before I think them. He knows my requests before I ask them. He knows the words off of my lips before I say them. He knows everything. Psalm 139 tells us that. He knows my rising up, my sitting down. He knows if I didn't rise up and if I didn't sit down, what would happen? Now, when did he learn these things? You tell me. Before the foundation of the world. He never learned them, actually. They were always part of him. All knowledge is always a part of God. This is his om omniscience, his all-knowingness. And out of all possible worlds, in the counsel of the Godhead, God chose, he made a decree. We call this his plan or decree in theology. He made a decree. This is what will happen. And he created heaven and earth. This one, did he know what would happen? Yes, sir. Whose plan was it? Are we in plan B? Then our spiritual mess is a perfect mess. Or God did something less than perfect. I got gotcha. you. You can argue with me. But this is a perfect mess. This is the exact mess of sin and death that our Heavenly Father wanted so that He could reveal to those willing subjects the depths of His mercy and grace, a quality of God that could have never been understood apart from sin and death. We would know Him in love, but we would never know Him in mercy. We would never know Him in grace. We would never know what it is to be completely unmeriting of any worth and to have a loving Heavenly Father step into time and space and relieve us of our sin and of the death and give us eternal life as a free gift. We would never know that apart from sin and death and apart from the depths of the sin and death that we are experiencing in us and all around us in this culture and in this world. You agree? We're not in plan B. This is not a mistake. This meaning everything 
everything here, everything we see. It's not a mistake. Our great God, great in all of his attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, immutability, his sense of being, our great God, unconditioned by anything apart from himself, unconditioned meaning completely free, unconstrained by any outside constraint that would cause, cause him to do anything that he would not normally do in him and of himself. Our great God implemented his plan before the foundation of the world. God's plan is according to his omniscience, directed by his power, and kept by his mercy and grace. God, great plan, made this mess. Now, let me put a caveat on that. He didn't make the mess. He set a world into place in which <laughs> we did it for him. <laughs> when Adam sinned, Adam sinned. When Judas betrayed Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus. When I chose to, oh, I'm not going to tell you that. I chose to. God didn't make me do it. Others didn't make me do it. I was unconstrained by any outside force. Even when I had a moment, a four-hour moment in my life when there was a gun put to my head, my behavior while being held hostage was my own behavior. Yeah, it was restricted by an outside force. But the choices I still had within that restriction were mine. Thank you. They were my choices. To attack, to submit, to say kind words, to cry, to beg for my life. All of these options were real. I thought about them. But the choices I made were mine. You get it? Within the context of who we are, how we were born, where we were raised, the era in which we were raised, the geography in which we were raised, God in his plan created a world in which his creatures would bring about by their actions certain consequences and more consequences and more consequences and more consequences known by God from when? From the beginning. Chosen by whom? God himself. Unconstrained by anything outside of himself, God sets in motion a world in which sin and death would reign through humanity on the basis of a conspiracy by evil supernaturalism embedded in our society. And so you and I were born to a certain family in a certain location at a certain time in a certain culture with certain neighbors and certain schools and certain and none of that was our choice. None of that. I didn't get to pick my parents. I did not get to pick my brother. Didn't get to pick my sister. Didn't get to pick my house. Not until I was a lot older. Didn't get to pick Harold Anderson, Harold and Eva, they live next door. Those two crackers is South Florida. They were crackers. You know what a cracker is? It's a, yeah, okay. I'll leave it go. Look that up. Google it. Florida cracker. It's nothing you get at the grocery store. I didn't get to choose Miss Ivok as my first grade teacher or Miss... Roach as my second grade teacher 
or Miss Singer or Mr. Amick or Mrs. Talbot or Mr. Spivak. I didn't get to choose those dudes. They just happened to me. Did they influence my life? Yes. So did Clint and Randy, Harold, Eva. So did Kenny. I'm pointing at houses on my street, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Freddie Moorhead. You know, all of those kids, all of those adults, I didn't get to pick those. I didn't get to pick any of that stuff. And every one of those cotton pickers shaped me. They gave me thoughts about myself and ideas about life that if I'm doing certain things, still pop into my head. I was doing something the other day, fiddling with a tool, and my dad said to me, and by the way, he's been dead eight years, my dad said to me, you're going to do it your way or the right way? And I said, okay, I'll do it the right way. And so I took an extra step. I was going to just take a shortcut, you know, and probably break the thing. But my dad said, it's not how you do it. And you know better. I didn't say it. And Jesus didn't say it. It was my dad talking to me. I didn't get to choose him. And so I, through God's plan, God's A plan, through his perfect plan, unless you want to impugn imperfection on God, through God's perfect plan, I received messages about myself throughout my life that shaped me so that I respond to life in ways that attempt and help me to attempt to manage my life, to protect myself, to meet my basic human needs. And unfortunately, all of that is apart from the sufficiency of a personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ. So that when I first became a pastor, I loved teaching the Bible. But I just couldn't hang around you people. Not because I didn't like you. I didn't have enough self-confidence to carry on a conversation with you. So I hid in my office. It wasn't your fault. Maybe it was my older brother's fault for always calling me a punk and a creep. Maybe it was my dad's fault. He grew up in the Depression and went through World War II, and he never learned from James Dobson how to raise a family. He learned from an Italian immigrant in the Depression in Harlem, New York. You see how I was shaped? No choice of my own. And my encouragement came from a grandmother who slapped me across the face and knocked one of my loose teeth across the living room and said, oh, that's funny, you just lost a tooth. That wasn't a bad thing, because that was normal. Oh, it sounds atrocious today, but hey, it was the 50s. We were different then. I didn't get to choose when I was born either, by the way. You see how spiritual life is apart from Christ? The lifestyle of in a relationship with God through his son by the spirit because of evil supernaturalism and the world culture and the inner destructive forces of self-determinism which is sin and the weakness of our flesh makes trusting God in plan A almost an impossibility. Inconceivable impossibility. We read the Bible, we hear messages like this are much better. And we try to affirm what's right. We say amen and I say I'm going to believe that and by this afternoon we won't be believing it in the way we behave. And we know that because that virus just keeps popping the same message up on the screen. And I can't fix the hardware. 
I've got to call the 800 number. I need outside supervision. I need to let somebody take hold of my computer and move my little mouse and cursor around and click on certain things that I didn't even know were part of this thing. Spend a half hour listening to somebody in some other country from some foreign place where there's a different citizenship. <laughs> You see the metaphor? I have to go outside of myself, beyond myself, and say, Father, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bondage of this death, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Wow. Now before we start talking about the perfect man in session two. I'd like to end with just a couple of little devotional thoughts, if I could. A little counseling here from Pastor Ed. Some of you might need this. I know I need it every day. Because you're never immune to the virus. God in his wisdom has seen fit not to take the virus away. A very strong pastor can fall into very grievous flesh patterns. A very good Bible teacher because of flesh patterns embedded in him from three, four, five, six, eight years old can revert back to those flesh patterns when undergoing certain stress and disappointments in his spiritual expectations in his walk with God. We've all known pastors who have failed. We've all known Bible teachers who have failed. We've all known men and women in Christ that we've loved and respected and walked side by side with who have failed because the virus just keeps coming back and we need the support we need to call the 800 number but i want you to know something before we talk about that 800 number and who's on the line that regardless of who or what or where we are in this life there isn't any person in here right now that's a mistake and if you've believed the lie somewhere in your life that you are a mistake and you've created the unpardonable and irreversible mistake, you've misunderstood the perfect in perfect mess. You've misunderstood whose plan you're really a part of. And my exhortation to all of us this morning is that Regardless of where you are in this mess we call humanity, that it's time to say, Lord, I'm going to call the hotline. I'm going to trust you. I am not plan B. I am not a mistake. I like to tell my church, there's one thing you can't say to God ever. You can never say to God, surprise, He already knows. He knew it before you breathed your first breath. He knew it about you in his timelessness from past, present, to future. He already knows you tomorrow. You're not a mistake. Can you trust God about that? Secondly, that, by the way, that doesn't excuse the mistakes we make. What I'm saying is you ontologically being here the way you are is not a mistake. Second thing I'd like you to be encouraged about is because of who we are in our uniqueness, every one of us in this room is completely unique from any other person in this room. Why? Because I guarantee you you're, the circumstances in which you were raised and grew up in the neighborhoods and all of those teachers that you can name that I can't all of those shaped you differently in God's providence than I got shaped when I was there. So you're a completely unique person. 
You're not a mistake. And as the person you are, we have the opportunity. God has seen fit to give us the opportunity because of sin and death. Not despite, but because of sin and death. God has given us the opportunity to know him through Christ by the Spirit in a way that we could have never known had there ever been sin and death. Listen to these verses from the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. I think that's in the New Testament somewhere. It says, Where sin increased, you want to finish it for me? Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, that's the mess. As sin reigned in death, here comes the opportunity. Even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you realize the opportunity that God has afforded us by allowing this creation to be engulfed in sin and death? He's afforded us the opportunity to know him in a depth of character and in mercy and in grace in his love that would have never been ours apart from this perfect mess. We have the opportunity to trust him. We are not mistakes. And we have the opportunity to know him in the depths of his mercy and grace. It's through Jesus Christ our Lord and it's in Christ Jesus our Lord that eternal life will reign by grace. Let's take a 15 minute break. Shut me off please.